In 2011, President Xi Jinping revealed his three dreams for Chinese football to qualify for the World Cup, to host the World Cup, and to win the World Cup. In 2014, China set forth to create an $800 billion sports industry by 2025. In 2020, China's General Administration of Sport unveiled plans to have 18 critical cities dedicated to football by 2025. Cities should aim to have two professional teams each, develop a grassroots culture in football, and have one football pitch for every 10,000 people by 2025. The overall goal for the General Administration is to make China a strong sporting nation by 2035, and football is a critical factor in that goal. In addition, the country will build dozens of new football-specific stadiums in critical regions and expect to bid to host the 2030 or 2034 World Cup. As China's influence on the global stage grows, football leagues, teams and sponsors are recognizing the potential to engage with a large group of new fans. China is already one of the biggest spenders on foreign clubs, with Chinese investors buying minority stakes in Manchester City, Atletico Madrid, majority stakes in Aston Villa and West Bromwich Albion, not to mention the entirety of AC Milan with an expected 250 million euros in additional merchandise sales from their 100 million Chinese fans. In 2004, FIFA recognized Tutu as the oldest form of football. Tutu is a type of Chinese kickball game with historical records dating to the Han Dynasty in the 2nd century BCE. With the backdrop of the modern growth in Chinese football, some wonder whether China has a more intimate connection to the sport as its original creators. It certainly fits a larger narrative of a revival of football in China. But did China really invent football? I think the answer is no. But let us first explore the history and development of Tutu from the Han Dynasty up to the modern day. According to legend, Tutu could be traced back to the mythological Yellow Emperor, who used the heads of his defeated enemies, the Chiyo barbarians, as kicking objects to humiliate them. Another legend said that it wasn't their heads, but their stomachs. The emperor would order the stomachs of his fallen enemies to be stuffed and then used as a kickball. It was only later that the activity would evolve into a form of exercise. Whether these stories are true is anyone's guess, but considering the brutal nature of primitive societies, I reckon it did happen although it's probably had no direct involvement in the evolution of the former game of Tutu later played in the Han Dynasty. I also doubt that human organs make for durable footballs. There could only be so many heads of your enemies to go around. Thousands of years later in the Han Dynasty, bravery and ritual in military practices gave way to the serious business of conquest and expansion. Chariot warfare declined and infantry warfare grew. The demands of military life led to the need for new activities to maintain the fitness of soldiers. This period was when Tutu first appeared in Sima Tian's records of the Grand Historian. The first Han Emperor, Gao Zhu, and his father were avid fans of Tutu and were said to have played the game since their youth. After ascending the throne, Emperor Gao Zhu duly promoted Tutu in the country by establishing Tutu military exercises, competition rules, and building Tutu infrastructure. Nobles and wealthy citizens alike were said to have built their own private pitches. The emperor had his very own football court, complete with a perimeter and grandstands, and when a match is underway, it would have looked remarkably similar to modern football matches today. The rules of Tutu in this period would be the most familiar to us today. Two teams play off with 12 players each, only one more player than in modern association football. Referees were also appointed, then six holes in the ground were set up on each side and victory goes to the team that can score the highest number of goals. The later Han period also saw the rise in Buddhism and the transfer of Buddhist teachings from China to Japan. The subsequent religious exchange saw the introduction of Tutu into Japan, which evolved into a similar sport called Kamari, a favourite pastime of Japan's warrior class, the Samurai. The Tang Dynasty was marked by a period of transition from the ancient to the medieval. During the Tang Dynasty, the core of the army consisted of an aristocratic elite who loved horses. The influence of cavalry was substantial, with the Tang Dynasty having 5,000 horses in 618 CE to 700,000 horses by 750 CE. The strong influence of horsemanship was reflected in military exercises through the game of polo called Jiju, possibly imported from Iran. Tang armies used polo as a means of military training, much as the Han armies played Tutu. Tutu also experienced a dramatic change in this period. 
it had evolved into an activity played by people from all walks of life, court officials, scholars, women and children. It was now played by one to nine players, whose purpose was to keep the ball in the air. Two kicks were allowed per player, after which the ball was passed. Further modifications saw the emergence of two goals, one at each end of the field, and the use of airfield balls. Its final form only had one goal in the middle and played a little bit like volleyball. In 877 CE, several scholars held a contest on a makeshift pitch, and one scholar, Liu Tan, was awarded the title of Jing Shi, or Advanced Scholar, for displaying expert football skills to the amazement of military onlookers. The Song Dynasty was a time of growth, wealth, and the spread of education. An increase in leisure time provided a greater demand for more forms of entertainment. Tuzu in this time became less of a football match, but more of a showcase of individual skill and technique. Players will perform various motions to keep the ball bouncing in the air. Tuzu clubs were also formed, functioning as a sort of football league. Clubs will send their teams from around the country to compete in league tournaments. Tuzu remains popular in the Ming Dynasty. The painting series, Pleasures of Emperor Xuanzhe, depicts a game of Tuzu played in the Emperor's presence. The traditional Chinese painting of beauties by Du Jing, a famous Ming Dynasty painter, portrays Chinese court ladies enjoying a game of Tuzu. Tuzu also made its way into the realm of the upper class, which once again had a big impact on its nature. The popularity of Tuzu among the upper class caught the attention of brothel prostitutes, who began to play Tuzu in erotic manners in front of their establishments. Exactly how they did it, I'll leave that up to your own imagination. This damaged the image of Tuzu, which became to be gradually seen as a vulgar spot. Emperor Hongwu, the first emperor of the Ming Dynasty, saw that his government officials were obsessed with Tuzu, often abandoning their governing duties to play with their friends. In response, he enacted a complete prohibition on the spot, with anyone breaking the law suffering severe consequences. Despite this, Tutu remained very popular. Thirty years later, Emperor Xuanzhe even castrated a soldier who was a good player so that he could play in court as a eunuch. Tutu experienced a stark decline in the Qing dynasty. Military drill, gymnastics and sports were directly counter to the dominant Qing concept of culture, characterized by intellectual ideals. Men of culture wore long gowns with long sleeves to signify that they were not involved in physical labor. Sports were an activity for the lower classes. Qing Dynasty pigtails, the dominant hairstyle for men, were also incompatible with professional sports. For women, the tradition of bound feet constituted an obstacle to sports participation. It was not until the late 1920s that Chinese women took part in sports in significant numbers. This influence can be seen in the late Republican period of China. When Chinese students first took up Western sports at missionary schools, they wore long gowns and were resistant to the introduction of physical education into their curriculum. Ernest Richard Hughes noted that 25 years ago, it was an effort for a schoolboy to shed his long gown to take part in a game of football. Looking back at the dynamic history of Tuzu, can we still say that football was invented in China? No. I personally don't think so, and I say this because of two reasons. Firstly, football is the most basic sport in human society. You either hit a ball or you kick a ball. It is difficult to say that any single group invented the idea of kicking a ball. The football of today, or to use its official name, Association Football, is a set of rules set in 1863 by the Football Association in England, which was further standardised by the IFAB, the International Football Association Board, in Zurich, Switzerland. The UK doesn't claim to have invented football, nor was it ever influenced by Tutu in China, but it did codify the set of rules that the entire world plays with today. To claim that China invented football, would be to forget that the development of modern-day association football and its rules had no relation to Tutu. The second reason why I consider that football cannot be invented in China is the tumultuous development of Tutu itself. Tutu went from a game resembling modern-day football in the Han Dynasty into volleyball with feet in the Song Dynasty and almost vanished in the Qing Dynasty. Even the most ardent believers in China's invention of football will struggle to find a continuous threat in the development of Tuzu. Should we really say that football was invented in China by virtue of it showing up in our earliest known history? Perhaps it is better to look at why this answer is important. 
there are three main reasons to why it is advantageous for China to claim credit for the origins of football. External prestige, domestic benefits, and additional revenue. External prestige is simple to understand, although in my opinion, not a very strong factor. Being the founder of football gives China brownie points in legacy and legitimacy in the sport. In terms of domestic benefits, as per typical Neo-Confucian tradition of ancestor worship and filial piety, it is beneficial for Chinese people to feel a sense of connection to football if they know that their ancestors have played it in the past. Football is also a great way to improve the overall health of Chinese citizens. It can get kids to play outdoors instead of computer games, a big issue in China, and foster societal unity through sports. Lastly, as the growth in football interest continues to rise in China, there is a lot of money to be made in Chinese football through broadcasting rights, ticket sales, and merchandise sales. While making this video, I was wondering whether China's investments in football would really pay off. In February of 2022, China suffered a 3-1 defeat against Vietnam in the FIFA World Cup qualifiers. This dashed any Chinese fan's hope of seeing their nation play in the World Cup, leaving them fuming on social media. Chinese football today is still at a tragic state, with an over-reliance on foreign talent and an inability to cultivate homegrown talent. Why is this so? Surely a population of 1.4 billion has at least 11 individuals skilled enough in football to play on the world stage. To try and understand why this is not the case, we would have to go back to school and look at the problems with modern physical education in China. Firstly, the Euro-American ideal of violent sport as an integral part of moral training and formation of character is quite alien to the traditional Chinese ethic. Parents also do not encourage their children's participation in sports and are even more against their competitive nature. Education authorities, instead of advocating for competitive sports, advocate for gymnastics and Chinese martial arts to inculcate diligence, obedience, endurance, morale, and national consciousness. With such a deep-rooted cultural resistance towards football and other competitive sports, it is important for China to rebuild the country's relationship with football from the ground up, which, as mentioned at the start of this video, is exactly what the government is doing. Their efforts may bear fruit in 2035 as planned, or it may take many more years. Nonetheless, I wish them all the best. If you enjoyed this video, consider watching my previous video on legendary ancient Chinese swords in the spring and autumn period. This post was primarily sourced from Sport and Physical Education in China by James Riordan and Robin Jones. Supporting sources came from Chinese websites, which might potentially suffer from a lack of evidence by their contributors. Please visit the link in the description to find out more. Thank you for watching.